I realized that um, if they didn't get me out pretty soon, my neck was going to snap. That was the moment at which I thought, this, this is it. This is, this is the end. This is how I will die. And I thought, I'm going to hell. And I was terrified. And that's when being human and occupying this human body of ours just came flooding back into me. My husband and I moved to Colorado about 13 years ago, and probably everybody that lives there, myself included, feel it's probably about as close to heaven as you can get. The antique store has become kind of a tourist destination, so we know everybody in town, and everybody brings their friends when they come to Salida. It's just worked out really wonderful. It was getting close to Thanksgiving, and during that time, I usually go to the Springs, number one, to do shopping for our antique store, and then also usually to have dinner with my son, do some more shopping the next day, and then take off. I was pretty loaded with stuff. <laughs> I had bought a lot of stuff for the store. I was very happy. My dog was in the back seat. Uh, Reebok is my best friend. He's my pal and buddy. I got him as a rescue puppy, and he's just with me 24-7 everywhere I go. Unfortunately, when I was just a few miles out of town, uh, my wheel uh, caught off the side of the road, and scared me to death. I thought I had a blowout. I was hanging on to the steering wheel. I saw these two 18-wheelers coming down. I figured I probably had about three seconds to live at that point. What I did not realize was to the right of the road was a very steep embankment. And I'm doing about 60 miles an hour, so of course it propelled my car up the embankment, sent it into a uh, spin, so to speak. And a couple spins later, my car landed upside down. And the next sound I heard was glass, the crunching of glass and plastic bags. And that's when I realized that my dog Reebok was in the back seat. He was scrambling over these bags, crunching the glass, and I heard him leave the vehicle and I started screaming, get my dog, get my dog, please somebody just get my dog. I tried to pull myself out of the vehicle, but I realized that the uh, weight of my body was right on the center point of the back of my neck, and I couldn't wiggle myself free. I, I couldn't really do anything but hang on to the steering wheel and try to keep my body weight up so that it didn't snap my neck. I was screaming for my dog, or yelling as loudly as I could. It was getting to harder to call for him because my mouth was uh, filling with fluids and I was starting to choke. And all the color was starting to go from my vision. I was scared because I should have been driving home. I should have been with my dog and all my goodies going back to Salida. I had no idea that life could change in a fraction of a second. Aniston's a small town environment. You know, people know each other. Uh, good, good school that our kids go to. So it, it's a, it's a great place to live. Ooh. 
You know, the funny thing is I don't like rodents. I don't like insects, <laughs> but it was a job and it paid the bills. So, so I would spend my days uh, crawling under houses. I had gotten a call that I needed to go to this house that was having some problems. And so probably about five o'clock when I arrived there, yeah, you know, I pulled up to the house and, and Jerry met me there. It was one of his rental houses. Uh, Matt was different from the beginning. He was a nice guy. He knew everything that was to be known about it, what his job was for and what it was about and what he was using. I, I liked him. Jerry took me to the side of the house where the crawl space opening was. And I remember the crawl space opening was about two feet by a foot and a half, so it was pretty small. And I um, actually had to throw my flashlight, throw my hat in, and actually look like I was diving in a pool to get under the house. You know, the crazy thing was Jerry sat there and watched me the whole time. I crawled under anywhere from five to seven houses a day. I never had a customer watch me, and uh, but he was there. And in fact, I remember thinking, man, if you quit watching me, I could get done with this a lot quicker. Crawled under that first support beam, uh, was making my way to the second support beam, and um, when I got ready to crawl under that second support beam, um, I is at the point at which I came in contact with a 110 volt wire. That's when things start to go crazy. That's when I heard that terrible sound of him getting electrocuted. Every muscle in my body was contracting and, and, um, and, and pulsating and, and just throbbing. There was a tremendous heat, uh, like almost as if my body was, was on fire. Uh, the, the heat electricity I felt like was actually burning my insides. I thought, this, this is it. This is, this is the end. This is how I will die. in White Pine, Tennessee. I was born and raised there all my life. That was a package delivery driver at UPS Plus a farm on the side. I had an online business uh, selling farm pet supplies. And we had a little local store, pet store. Family was important, but it was way back from making bucks. It was the whole thing, is make as much money as you can. You know, whoever died with the most toys is one that won. And we brought it back home, which wasn't nothing unusual. We never ate out. We were constantly eating at the house where I could work at the same time that I eat. I put some cheese on it from the house and it was running up orders, you know, while I eat the chili. I don't even think I got finished with my little bowl of chili until I started getting sick. I threw up everything that you could possibly throw up to the point of what we used to call the dry heaves and uh, sweat. Lord, I couldn't have jumped in a tub of water and been any wetter. It was hurting down my arm, in between my shoulders. But I attributed that to, you know, it must be muscle spasms from throwing up so much. After about two hours of it, I went down the hall and uh, woke my wife. But I remember telling her, you know, I, I need to go to the hospital. I mean, I've gotten sick off of either the chili or the cheese. And she looked at me and said, no, you're having a heart attack. The symptoms in his arm, you know, across his back, him nauseated, everything, just said, screamed heart attack. And I said, we need to go now. So I ran into the kitchen, and I got an aspirin and made him chew an aspirin. And then off we went to the emergency room. Which even then argued and said, no, I'm not having a heart attack, you know. Just because you're a cardiac nurse don't mean we're all having heart attacks. 
I'm just sick. <laughs> He hooked me up to an uh, EKG machine, and he never said a word. He just, he had this funny look on his face, and Denise jerks it from his hands, and she gets this same look on her face. I thought, oh, crap, I'm having a heart attack. It was a very long segment of his right coronary artery that was blocked. So I'm really terrified at this point. I mean, I was sitting there, and the only thing I could think to do was pray. Never did pray to come back, didn't pray to live. I just prayed that I'd die with a smile if I was going to some die. And I prayed that I'd be forgiven. The uh, weight of my body was right on the center point of the back of my neck. My mouth was uh, filling with fluids and I was starting to choke. And at some point, and I truly don't remember whether the paramedics were there or not, I realized that um, if they didn't get me out pretty soon, my neck was gonna snap. So I hollered to whoever was around me, you have about 30 seconds because I know that my neck is gonna snap. It was just like magic. The door opened up, some hands grabbed me and they slid me out into the roadway. As soon as they slid me into the ambulance, I knew that every chance I had of getting my dog was gone, and I just said, please, dear God, you are the only thing at this point that can take care of my dog. She had what's called a pulmonary contusion, um, which means that there was blood um, in the alveoli, the air sacs, and the lungs themselves. When she got to the emergency department, she had started having trouble breathing. Her oxygen saturations or her ability to oxygenate deteriorated as her lungs filled up with blood to the point where her condition had become life-threatening. I felt like I was in one of those TV movies, those medical emergency movies, because everybody seemed to be in such chaos. But I heard my son's voice. And I, I just felt such relief because I knew that family was there. People with pre-existing lung disease very often um, can deteriorate into what's called adult respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS, which has a very high mortality rate. And that was what we suspected was gonna happen with D. trauma surgeon that was taking care of her felt that we needed to put a breathing tube in for her um, and put her on the ventilator. We were about 15 minutes away from Colorado Springs. Brendan calls and he says, they're going to have to put her under. I said, what do you mean? And they said, they have to put her under and put her on a respirator. And from what the doctor says, it's a life or death situation. And I asked him, couldn't they wait till we get there? And he says, no. So I said, just tell her we love her. And we'll be there as soon as we can. All of a sudden, all I could see was the color orange and the color blue. And I thought, well, this is weird. Then I started to experience pain. I felt as if somebody had picked me up by my ankles and used me as a baseball bat and slammed me on a cement surface. And I remember screaming with all my might. And the pain at that point was so intense, I totally blacked out.
And I looked down, and as I looked down, that's when I realized I didn't have a body. And all of a sudden, I am in this totally fantastic saffron gold yellow color. The, the heat electricity I felt like was actually burning my insides. I thought this this is it. This is this is the end. This is how I will die. That's when I heard that terrible sound of him getting electrocuted. He was, I think, about 16 feet away with his face down. I thought he was dead. It was pain like I've never experienced before. Um, and um, my head was like a, like, a, like a basketball being dribbled real, real low to the ground, uh, like a duka 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 duka. My teeth were like a wind-up set of chatter teeth. You know, you wind them up and chick, 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 your teeth are chattering. Well, that's what my teeth were doing. In the midst of everything that was taking place, I do remember being scared. And, and I think my fear was probably more for my family uh, than it was for me, because I knew that they were going to experience the pain of, of losing someone that they loved dearly. I did feel, I did sense that my heart was was, was, was stopping, that it stopped. But it was in that moment that I was taken from it and actually allowed just to witness it from outside of my body. I began to, to realize that this is, this is the end, this is it. This is um, that dying experience. I've always wondered, how is it gonna happen? Well, here it goes. At that point is when everything went to the supernatural. So I'm really terrified at this point. I mean, I was sitting there, the only thing I could think to do was pray. They go in and put a balloon in the uh, coronary artery to flatten the plaque against the coronary artery wall so blood is restored to that part of the heart. You know, one minute I'm dressed, the next minute I'm, I'm not. And then they shave off your groin area. You can't have anybody hair around your groin area because that's where they're going to go in at. The little old lady come by, and I can't remember what they said, her name, Gracie or something. She takes her hand and she rubs and she goes, oh, that's not good. So she takes a razor and she shaves. <laughs> she goes, <laughs> and she shaves. <laughs> she looks back and I'm grinning, thinking this is the funniest thing I've ever saw. Bad as I'm hurting, I still thought it was funny. <laughs> and I'm thinking, God, don't laugh, she'll castrate you. <laughs> His heart rate was going down and his blood pressure was going down. And at that time, I did not know if he would make it or not. And it really worried me. It really did. I was cold. God, it was ever, I mean, it was just like being in an icebox. And every breath seemed like it just took that much more energy to get. I didn't feel great, but I felt good. You know, the pain relieved. I still freezing my butt off, but then it collapsed. And when it collapsed, was uh, it was just like getting hit with a sledgehammer. He was going, Anthony, hang with me, buddy. Anthony, buddy, hang with me. But every time he would say it, it sounded like he was backing away. And then all of a sudden, I couldn't hear him anymore. And 
And that's when I realized that I, the reason I couldn't get my breath is I was dead. I quit watching the monitors. I, I looked at him and started praying. That's all you can do. And I looked down, and as I looked down, that's when I realized I didn't have a body. And all of a sudden, I am in this totally fantastic saffron gold yellow color. thing that really worried me is she's got scar tissue on her lungs and I knew about that and so I knew if she was to be injured the, the lungs were the worst place for her to be injured. I was starting to realize that the colors were changing. The first color I remember kind of washing over me was this beautiful magenta and I was so taken with how deep and rich and full this color was. And at some point, it was almost like I was on a little mini, or my mind was on a little mini roller coaster because all of a sudden I would get whished through another color. I thought I was hearing music. And sure enough, the music got closer, the sounds got clearer, and the sounds and the music just kind of converged together, and it was absolutely phenomenally beautiful. Their brain dies after about four minutes with no oxygen. Lots of other tissue in the body can survive without oxygen for long periods of time, but the brain uh, only has about four minutes. I seem to have questions inside myself, but every time there would be a question, it's as if some hand would brushed the side of my face, only there was no face. It was brushing the side of my soul. I became totally relaxed at this point. I knew that I was definitely somewhere else, yet I was still me, and I was very much at home with this. And all of a sudden, I realized that where I was, I was in the presence of God. When that happened to me, all the colors just faded away. And all of a sudden, I was, I was out in the cosmos. I saw the stars. I saw the universe. I saw the past, I saw the present, and I saw the future, but I saw it all at once. It was like I understood. And it was so beautiful. This is um, that dying experience. I've always wondered, how is it going to happen? Well, here it goes. experienced the very real um, plane of, of a, of a 39-year-long life movie being played uh, where I was allowed to literally see my life flash before my eyes. I saw image after image, and, and what I saw was the faces of people that I'd had the opportunity to, to know and have relationships with over the years. But what I, what I vividly remember is at the end of this movie, I remember uh, seeing the face of my wife and my three kids. And they're the reason, one of the reasons I exist is to, uh, to be a dad and to be a husband to my family.
I knew I had to get the mat. I was the only hope he had. And a slim one at that. And I just dove through that hole to try to get there as quick as I could. As I'm experiencing the movie, I'm actually experiencing the very real presence of, of God. It, it happened through the form of a, through light. Uh, it happened through the, the form of actually hearing my name, actually being called. That light was uh, all encompassing. It was, it was surrounding me. It was, it was basically at that point, the essence of who I was was, the, was that light. As I'm moving, if you will, almost closer to the light, um, I heard God literally speak my name. Imagine if thunder could speak, if, if when you heard thunder, it actually was speaking your name. But it was in that moment that I knew that God was, was very real and very in that moment for me. And that's when I realized that I, the reason I couldn't get my breath is I was dead. And then all of a sudden, I seen at the speed of light every thought that I'd ever had, everything that I could have done and didn't, uh, everything that I said that I shouldn't, everything that I didn't say that I should have. It's all traveling at the speed of light, but it's all slow enough to digest each and every second. It wasn't like any type of slideshow, home movie, anything. This was like you were actually reliving it, only it's like that moment is inside of you all over again. A lot of the stuff that I thought was okay, because everybody does it, suddenly it didn't look so okay. And I thought, I'm going to hell. And I was terrified. This is the point in time that I'm leaving my body. When I look back at my body, it could have been anybody's body. I felt no connection. I watched one of the nurses come running in uh, to try to help the doctor and the other nurse. I saw that from actually being above, not just sitting up, but being above the whole thing. And my wife was lined up to the far left and I could see the person standing beside her, talking to her, trying to console her. And I could see the worry and, uh, you know, turmoil on her face. It's a very critical time at that point, making sure that, you know, you get that artery back open. They put him in the coronary artery wall to hold the coronary artery wall open. Anthony had such a long blockage in his coronary artery that they had to put two end to end. The next thing I saw was just the whole room illuminated. It was a light that was filled with love, peace, joy, acceptance. It seemed like everything, every flaw that I had had been corrected. And there was really nothing I wanted for. I was at peace, content. When I'm trying to communicate to my wife, and you know, I'm trying to tell her that I'm, I'm better than, than great. I am excellent. I am perfect for the first time in my life. Not to cry, not to worry, not to be sad. But no matter how hard I tried to get my point across to them, I couldn't. And all of a sudden, I realized that where I was, I was in the presence of God.
At some point, and I don't know when this happened, but I felt a coming back into myself. I wanted to go back. I tried to turn my mind or my soul or my being around to go back. I desperately wanted to go back to where I had just been, but I felt like I hit a cement wall. When Brendan pulled that curtain back and I saw her there with all the tubes out of her, I knew how serious it was. We're giving her pulmonary medications um, through the endotracheal tube that um, keep the airways opened up, uh, but, but there aren't any magic medicines um, to fix the issue. It's a matter of trying to keep her stable until uh, her lungs start doing the work on their own. And I remember um, uh, Dr. Leiner saying that now is just out of our hands. Um, it was just a matter of watching and waiting and letting God decide um, what he was going to do with her. About 10 o'clock that night, I found out nobody had the dog. I said, we have to go. We have to go find the dog. And they said, it's, it's night. It's dark. The dog is black. It's beside the highway in the middle of nowhere. I said, we have to go. We have to go. We're looking all up behind the accident site, and I mean, we searched and we screamed and I couldn't talk anymore. And I said, Lord, I said, if Dee wakes up and I don't have this dog, I said, I don't know what she's gonna do. She won't make it. <laughs> so I kind of shook my fist at God and said, you've got to help me find this dog. <laughs> and I drove right down the hill and there he was, and he came to me, and it, it was just one of the small miracles of the whole thing that happened. I looked up, and I saw what was a figure standing over me. I didn't realize this was a figure. I didn't realize it was human. I had lost concept of what being human was or what a, a human body was. And it wasn't until he smiled that I recognized my son. It was, it was almost as if my mind was one of these little flip toys and it just went ching, 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 boom. And he squeezed my hand and he said, I love you, mom. And that's when being human and occupying this human body of ours just came flooding back into me. As I'm moving, if you will, almost closer to the light, um, I heard God literally speak my name. When I saw the encompassing light, when I heard my name being called by this powerful voice, it's when everything stops. The wire was hanging in the middle of his back, and I just reached and got the pipe and brought it up. Uh, pushed the wire out of the way. Uh, I remember at that point being pushed over onto my right hand shoulder and I, I, I looked and, and I saw the, the, the face of Mr. Jerry Oswald, uh, the man who owned the house. So how'd you get here so quick? I said, Matt, I don't know. I really don't. I, w I was overcome by um, appreciation for him, appreciation for, for what God had done, what, what, it, what had taken place. There's no way he could have gotten in the crawl space in that amount of time, just based on his ability, his physical ability at that time. 
we crawled out from under the house together, got out from under it, and remember telling him, I, I, I need help, my body's hurt, call 911. They were just astonished that I was, number one, I was alive, and number two, that there was no uh, long-term lasting side effects long-term exposure to electricity like that can, can often cause uh, neurological damage, can, can often cause uh, cardiological damage to your heart. And um, yeah, every one of them to the person said, you obviously have a reason and a, and a purpose for being here because you should be dead. There was really nothing I wanted for. I was at peace, content. I was above the doctor at that point in time. I really don't think that I made the conscious decision to come back, although I was thinking, you know, I got a wife and kids, and it would sound better if I said, you know, oh, I knew I had a wife and children I had to come back to, but really I don't think I had a whole lot of say in the matter. But I do remember looking down, and I thought, if I do go back, this is going to hurt like hell. It wasn't like there was any type of motion at all. I mean, it. you're here and bam, you're there. You know, it's just like getting hit with a ton of lead. <laughs> the first thing I remembered when I opened my eyes uh, was that I actually that I at both my requests filled, I had been forgiven, and I requested that I not die without a smile on my face. And I was smiling when I went out, and I was smiling when I come back. The second thoughts were, oh dear God, I'm in pain. <laughs> but I knew I was supposed to fight. I mean, I, I knew that. I think we're all supposed to fight with everything we have and not make the decision of when it's time to go. Yeah, the whole experience was very, um, very surreal because in, in that moment where my body was literally convulsing with pain, I really would really equate it to, to almost like a hell experience. But in that, in that moment of experiencing hell, I, I was literally experiencing heaven in a very real way. The significance of that moment for me was that I needed to, to, to be reminded that God hadn't forgotten me. I went to college, got a master, did all the stuff I was supposed to do, and I, here I am crawling under houses looking for insects. This is not what I felt like I was created for. And um, I need to be reminded that my life does have purpose. Now, it's not wrapped up in what I do. It's wrapped up in who I am. I sent a bug man down in that hole and pulled a preacher out. I don't fear death. I've been to the edge and I've tasted and I've experienced it. I've been reluctant to change light bulbs since then. <laughs> yeah. But there's, uh, what I think what's on the other side of dying for me is so much greater than what I live for that no, I don't fear death. As I was done, I realized that all of the plaques and all the attaboys and all of the money and all of the toys and all that time that I'd spent being in a hurry, all that was for nothing. It wouldn't buy me another second. And it sure didn't ease my pain. And it didn't help my passing. 
you know, with my relationship with my wife, with my daughters, with my parents, my friends. Those are the things that really matter. When Anthony first came back and he was out of the sedation, he said, you know, uh, he said, I love you. He said, and you know, thank you for what you did for me and getting me to the hospital as soon as you did. I don't know. Um, it, it could be that there's something. It could be that I can help somebody somehow. It, it, like I write a blog. It's almost become like a diary now. There's some doctors and some nurses that say that they read it every night and it's helped them with their patients. And it's not well written. I mean, it's, God, it's horrible. I talk horrible, I write horrible. But it comes from the heart. That could be the reason. What I've told Denise, and I've told my children too, you know, if the time comes, and it will come, uh, be it cancer or wreck, you never know, but it all, it comes for all of us. And when it does, I don't want her to be sad because I haven't died. I've actually came alive. One of the first things that they did was, of course, tell me that my dog had been found, that Reebok was alive. He was about two feet off the roadway. My sister knew the minute they grabbed a hold of the dog and got him in the car that she knew I was going to live. The dog became important to all of us, and we were all grateful the next morning when we found out that, that her dog had been found. My sister had gone over to the parking garage where the dogs were in the car and had taken Reebok out of the car. She stuck his forearm out and waved it back and forth so from my hospital bed I could look out the window and I could see my dog, and of course, as soon as I saw that he was okay, I was crying and couldn't tell anybody because I couldn't talk, so I just laid there and cried. I could see from 50 yards away that she recognized. She was happy to see the dog to me, I think. <laughs> I felt as if my whole soul had been splayed open. Very profound experience, to say the least, for somebody who prayed occasionally. And now I feel like every minute of my life is a prayer. And I'm so blessed to have had the experience that I did. So did it change my life? Absolutely. I know that the person I used to be is still there, but I truly feel like, like Dee died. I still have her memories. I still have her thoughts. I still have some of her bad habits. <laughs> but I'm a different person. And I've never known such happiness. I want other people to know that there really is something beyond what we have here. There really is a beyond and back.